order. We must move on to questions to the Minister of Education, and I must tell you that questions 8 and 11 have been withdrawn. And I again call Mr. Colum Eastwood. Mr. Eastwood. Question number one, please. Thank you. Uh, the schools programme of Erasmus Plus, which replaces the previous Comenius programme, offers a wide range of opportunities for pupils, students and teachers to participate in partnership and exchange activities across Europe. The EE programme aims to boost skills and employability whilst modernising education, training and youth work. The British Council, with ECORIS, the National Agency for the Delivery of Erasmus Plus programme, on behalf of the European Union. The National Agency is responsible for keeping schools informed about the programme and supporting them in the application process. They have hosted workshops across the North during October and November, and there are further events scheduled for December and January. My department continues to work with the National Agency to ensure that schools are encouraged to take up the opportunities that the programme offers and are supported in making successful bids. In addition, my department notified schools in January 2014 of the EU's new Erasmus Plus programme, and this was followed up by a press release in October this year to highlight the publication of the deadlines for the 2015 round. My press release encouraged schools and youth programmes to apply for funding and highlighted the benefits of participating in this programme. Fifteen schools here have already been successful in applications to Erasmus Plus. My department will continue to work with the British Council to promote the programme to ensure the participation of schools and youth organisations is maximised. Call Mr. Eastwood for supplement. Uh, thank the Minister for his answer. And just can I ask him uh, what level of funding is available for schools that uh, want to become involved in the programme? Uh, the level of funding can be up to 70% uh, of the initial bid. So I'll, I'll give you an idea of in terms of schools that have already been successful. Of the 107 applications have been received from organisations uh, here, equivalent to 6.8% of the total of here and Britain. 50% of the applications organisations in the North have been successful. In total, €5,673,463 has been awarded to organisations here. So there is quite a significant level of funding uh, available to successful applications. Hence, the reason why the Department have been encouraging schools to apply, why we are working with the British Council in relation to this matter, and encouraging participation in the programme. Call Mr. Nelson McCausland for question number two. Uh, I recognise the importance of the United Nations Conventions on the Right of the Child, UNCRC, and appreciate its value in setting out how children and young people shall be brought up in the spirit of peace, dignity, tolerance, freedom, equality and solidarity. Many of my department's policies ensure that children and young people have access to educational opportunities and materials, both in keeping with their cultural identity and the identity of others. In particular, the curriculum supports the principles of the UNCRC and specifically those related to identity and culture. Mr. McCausland for supplementary. Um, Mr. Speaker, in a written response to a written question, which I received the other day from the Minister, he mentioned uh, the Ulster Scots Education Project, which is producing materials in regard to culture, history and language. Uh, am I right in assuming that his department has not contributed one penny to that, that it has been funded entirely by the Ulster Scots Agency? And would he also contrast that with the fact that he recently gave £140,000 to Irish Medium Youth Work? There seems to be something of a disparity between £140,000 and nothing. Um, my department uh, is working with the Ulster Scots Agency in relation to the production of materials, working with SIA. I understand that the Ulster Scots Agency is funded to provide materials to the Ulster Scots community, so I think it's a particularly good idea that my department works with the Ulster Scots Agency to promote materials for Ulster Scots cultural expression. I thought you both thought that was a good idea rather than a bad idea. Or perhaps your problem is this. You don't want any money going to the Irish language sector. Perhaps that's the problem. So if that is the problem, I can't help you with that problem. But if you want me to support the Ulster Scots Agency further and the Ulster Scots culture further, I'm more than happy to sit down and talk to you about it and to see how we do it. Could I just, perhaps before I call it, remind the Minister and others that they must address the remarks through the Chair and the dreaded word you should not be used. I call Ms Rosie McCarley. 
Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. And Deglo Mira and Ira, Kajamarata, Kyarti Kultur, Apasji, Kosinta, and Yelijika Sakor Shraha, how are children's cultural rights uh, in the Irish medium sector met under the current system? Uh, thank the member for her question. Uh, as the member will be aware, under the Good Friday Agreement and the subsequent legislation, uh, the Irish medium sector uh, is protected under legislation which sees the department uh, facilitating and supporting the growth of the Irish medium sector. There are over now 3,000 children uh, attending Irish medium primary, or Nyskolna, Bonskolna and Munskolna. Uh, across the north. It's a growing sector. My department will continue to uh, invest appropriately in it, and we will also continue to invest in youth work in relation to the Irish medium sector as well. I call Mr. Cahill Oisin for a question. The last question is question three. During the 2014, during 2014, my department received three development proposals relating to the Irish medium sector. One of these sought the opening of a full-time nursery at Gale School on Cookstown. Although I did not approve full-time provision, I did approve the establishment of a new part-time nursery unit at the school. There was also a development proposal for the expansion of Gale School Egakery, Straban, through the establishment of an off-site unit. I had concerns about the impact of this off-site unit could have, had, could have had on the host school and did not approve the DP. However, I did recognise that there was a demand for Irish medium education in the area. And I asked Corleone the Gale Scoliactia, the Western Education Library Board, and CCMS to further explore options in this area. The third development proposal published for the establishment of an Irish medium post primary school in Dungiven. I can advise the member that my officials are currently collating all the pertinent information to enable me to make a decision on that proposal. Call Mr. Oshin for supplementary. The schemes actually be announced any time soon, and uh, when can we look forward? The minister is obviously aware of my interest in a number of the schemes. Will they then be announced any time soon? In relation to the, the Dungavan, Dungavan, uh, development proposal. My officials are still working on uh, the evidence collated during the eight-week consultation period. Once the documentation comes to me, I will make a decision uh, as quickly as possible in relation to that matter. It is a quite a complex uh, development proposal. However, I am aware of the urgency felt within the area for this development proposal to be decided on one way or the other, and I will work at it as quickly as I possibly can. Mr. Danny Kennehan. I thank the Minister for his uh, answer so far. And whilst we're talking about the Irish medium sector, can I just say I'm appalled and embarrassed by what's going on over the Irish language. On this subject, though, what is the effect that's going to have on other voluntary schools where we have development plans that seem to be splitting off the Irish medium sector from groupings with other sectors? We need to make sure that we have a level playing field for everybody. Um, well, each development proposal will be judged on its own merits, and it will take into account the impact of either a positive or negative response to that development proposal to other schools in the area. Uh, Irish medium is a growth area within our education system. There is a growing demand among parents for it. But as I've shown in the three development proposals that are, I have referred to Mr. Ahoshin's answer, I torn down one. I made a stipulation on another that it would not be full-time, it would be part-time, and I have yet to make a decision on a third. So uh, they are being put through rigorous tests uh, against the, the principles of the sustainable schools policy and against the principle of my department's legal obligation to facilitate uh, the Irish medium sector. So there is no guarantees either way. When a development proposal comes forward, I can assure the member that all aspects of it are taken into account. Call Ms. Claire Sugden. In the Irish medium sector, what plans does the Minister have to bring forward a governance and funding policy proposals for sectors not under the remit of the new Education Authority? Um, I, I have no plans to bring forward any further funding other than that which is set out as part of the discussions around the Education Authority, that being for the control sector. Uh, 
we are about to enter one of the most difficult phases of education in terms of its budget for many, many years. Uh, and I'm looking to see where we can save money in terms of education rather than opening up new funding streams. Call Mr. Patsy McGloan. Good morning, good last young colleagues. My wife is Lashin Ayras and the Fregri Gnigisha, Erin Kursi Fui Lahar. Thanks very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I, I thank the Minister for his answers up until this point. Uh, and Fregri Lashin Ayras, according to you, you can see the master of the Jante and Rin Sigihian, Er Nahashina, I guess, Er Kursi Stratesha, last year in Rin Adiv and Chorus Education Gila. Uh, could I ask the Minister? To provide us with some detail as to what assessment has been carried out by his department, <clears throat> both in terms of facilities provided and also uh, strategic direction for Gael Educas, for Irish language education. Uh, Thank you, Member, for his question. The Member will be aware of the Irish Medium Review, which was published during my uh, predecessor's time and still is a reference, significant reference document and policy document within my department in relation to the expansion of the Irish medium sector, and we have seen growth within the Irish medium sector. Only, I think, two to three weeks ago within this House, I announced the publication of the Irish medium post-primary review, which sets out a pathway to the development of further post-primary provision uh, within the Irish medium sector. Uh, and as I've referred to and responded to Mr. Kehala Hushing, there is, a, there is a development proposal in, in relation to the expansion of, or the development of a standard on post-primary provision in the Dungiven area, which will have to go through the normal processes. So we have taken proactive steps to develop the Irish medium sector. We have firm policies in place. We have funding streams in place. Uh, and we are responding to the demand of parents and communities in relation to the Irish medium sector. But as I also said to Mr. Kenahan, I will only approve development proposals which adhere to uh, my department's policies, are educationally robust, and are sustainable going into the future. Call Mr. Peter Weir for a question. Uh, question. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I have continued to implement policies and provide funding for additional interventions to raise standards and increase equity. Strategies include the revision to the school's funding formula, which directs additional money at those schools serving high proportions of pupils with free school meals. I am also supporting a number of programmes to improve pupil outcomes in literacy and numeracy, particularly target of pupils at risk of low levels of attainment. I am seeking full implementation of the entitlement framework. Young people who see their time in education as relevant to their future and have access to courses that interest them are more likely to achieve their full potential. My proposal for the revised special educational needs uh, and inclusion policy aims to provide a framework to promote early identification, assessment and provision for saying children so they can achieve their full potential. I hope to bring a special educational needs draft bill to the executive shortly. Outside school, they have provided funding to support the development of better links between schools, parents and local communities. From September 2014, through the extension of the free school meals entitlement, an additional 12,000 pupils are eligible to this benefit and school uniform grant. Sure Start has been ex ex expanded to the top 25 per cent most disadvantaged, disadvantaged wards by April 2015. The development of a pupil attendance strategy will focus on improving the attendance of children and young people who have low levels of academic achievement. However, the continued use of academic selection by some schools is a barrier to addressing under underachievement, particularly in disadvantaged communities, and I strongly encourage those schools to move away from academic selection so we can eradicate this social division. Mr. Weir, for supplementary. Thank the Minister for his response. It's a little bit disappointing that he. Uh, keeps on dragging in the, the chestnut of academic selection as the answer to everything in relation to this. Uh, can I ask the Minister, there's obviously particular concerns amongst the low level of attainment of uh, particularly males from a unionist background on free school meals in terms of the low levels of attainment. The Minister has outlined um, a number of initiatives there which principally focus in on the schools, but, but I wonder if he could give a bit more information on the issue of levels of support or opportunities for support for a number of community-based uh, organisations who are seeking to, to tackle um, educational underachievement. Well, the member may be disappointed by what he terms as me dragging in academic selection, but I'm not dragging it in. International evidence is dragging it in. Your party is choosing to ignore that evidence because it doesn't suit your current agenda. But you can't stand up and be concerned 
about education and underachievement in Protestant working class communities and ignore academic selection. Simply can't do it. Now, I have also outlined in my answer to you several uh, policies which are directly targeted at uh, ensuring that those young people who are at danger of educational underattainment are assisted and helped through those programmes. You ask me about community based programmes. I, I, I believe you're right in the sense that I believe, in general terms, our educational policies in the classrooms are the correct ones. I said when I came into office we need to drive them with more rigour and more vigour, and we've been doing that ever since. But it's the, the community has a crucial role on raising educational aspirations. I have set aside in the last year's budget £2 million for community interventions. It's a new departure for the Department of Education, where we largely in the past focused solely in on what happened within the school gates. We are focusing outside the school gates now to see if we can help support communities and families. The member will be aware of my advertising campaign, which runs across the media, uh, calling and, and supporting families in relation to them becoming involved in their children's education. And we have also invested heavily in youth work, particularly in disadvantaged communities, to inspire young people to become engaged in formal and informal education through youth work as well. So there's many initiatives going on, but you simply cannot ignore academic selection. Well, Mr. Roy Beggs. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The Northern Ireland Audit Office report of February this year, our follow on report of February this year, um, drew particular attention to the very close linkage between absenteeism, truancy, and poor educational attainment. Now, that's a very fundamental issue. If you're not at school, you will not uh, reach your full potential. So, can the Minister advise what action has he taken, along with other ministers, to help ensure that parents and indeed local communities are empowered? And indeed, what actions has he taken within his own department in terms of empowering the schools and the educational welfare officers so that they can help parents and young people reach their full potential? Uh, thank the member for his question. The member excuse me, is absolutely correct. If children are not in school, then they won't be benefiting from the educational experience of school. But there are many, many different reasons as to why children become uh, habitual absentee uh, statistics. So what we have to do is work with the school and the families, and as I responded to the previous questioner, uh, we have to work with communities to raise awareness and aspirations around education, to raise the importance of education and to raise the importance of attending schools. My department is currently drawing up a response uh, uh, as a result of the Audit Office report and the, and the work of the Public Accounts Committee. We are engaged in detailed work around how we can improve our work and our interventions uh, supporting the boards and, in the future, the Education Authority in, in this regard, and we will publish a strategy in due course. Well, Mr. Chris Hazard. Well, I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Can I ask the Minister to outline uh, what he is doing to ensure early intervention in areas of low academic uh, targets? Thank you very much. Um, we have, uh, as has the Executive, invested quite significantly in early interventions across several departments. Uh, to encourage families and uh, upskill families to ensure that they have the abilities and, and the knowledge to assist their young people from a very, very early age in their educational pathways and their learning pathways. So that's across various departments. We are now uh, making available to every child whose parent wishes to have a preschool place. I'm go through the same policy I hope to bring forward to the executive or the same legislation I hope to bring forward to the executive in the very near future. We are also targeting early intervention, the, the, the identification at an early stage of any SAIN requirements any individual child has, and then following that up with support. So there's a number of areas my department are involved in, and a number of areas we wish to develop in the near future. Well, Mr. Tom Buchanan for a question. Question number five, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The independent panel conducting the review of school transport presented their report to me at the end of August. I am now taking time to consider the report and its recommendations before deciding on the way forward. The report will be published in due course. Well, Mr. Buchanan, for a supplementary. The issue of home to school transport is something that has been uh, lobbied in this chamber for quite some time now. And would the Minister agree that his delay in issuing the report is of grave concern to parents and is actually curtailing education and library boards? from providing transport in extremely dangerous rural areas? And does he agree that some flexibility needs to be instilled into the old scheme 
until he sees fit to bring forward this programme. Well, there are already uh, measures in place for any board that believes that children are travelling a dangerous road to provide them with transport. The review is extensive. It examines transport from many, many different angles. It has spoken to many stakeholders, in particular pupils who use our transport system. But the magic answer, which will please everybody, is not contained within that report, because everybody has a different view on transport. It is probably the most hotly contested issue in relation to education in terms of provision by the boards. Maybe saying then transport, but in some areas it will be transport, particularly rural communities uh, in, in relation to transport. So I will publish the report in due course, but I emphasise to the member that the report presents challenges to everyone. It will test the will of everyone in terms of where they want to see the transport provision, where the priorities are for transport provision going into the future. And it will also test us in this context, as I responded to a previous uh, questioner, we are entering the most difficult education budget this Assembly has ever seen. We currently spend over £70 million on transport. Approximately £30 million of that is in relation to special educational needs. The rest is for a variety of reasons. Um, it is highly unlikely that we will be able to continue to spend that amount of money in transport going into the future. Call Mr. Pat Ramsey. <clears throat> thank you, Deputy Speaker. And I thank the Minister. Uh, but could I follow on from Tom Buchanan's question? Is there any lessons learned or any measures that the Minister could bring in in light of the most recent and awful tragedy on our roads that's seen you know, death come to the family's door? There has to be, Minister, better ways of doing this. I have asked the, the relevant uh, board, the North East Education and Library Board, to deliver me a report in relation to the circumstances which they are responsible for uh, in regards to the Gilmore family and regards to the events that led up uh, to the tragic death of young Adam Gilmore. I am also conscious that there is a PSNI investigation going on into that matter, uh, and the PSNI will take primacy in relation to any investigation that goes on. But I can assure the member that when we talk about boards and we talk about transport provision and we talk about transport officers, etc., board members, board officers, board staff are parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles, brothers and sisters themselves. And they're only too consciously aware of the tragedy that befell the Gilmore family. And could things have been done differently? Let's wait to see what the report tells us. But I can assure you. Uh, the, the, the anguish of, of the Gilmore family is felt by the North Eastern Education and Library Board staff, and they want to ensure that if things could have been done different, they are done different going into the future. But I, 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 I caution, I'm not suggesting the member is, but I caution sometimes the, the, the proportionment of blame in relation to this tragedy uh, to a board, because a board is made up of people. Call Mr. Jim Allister. I, I discern from what the minister says that two weeks on, he still has not received a report from the Northeastern Education Library Board in respect of how they handled the circumstances giving rise to the tragic death of young Adam Gilmore. Would you agree with me that it's equally unsatisfactory that two weeks on, the same Education Library Board is yet unable to say to the Gilmore family? whether even now they will provide transport to them on this provenly dangerous road? Um, well, for the record, the North East Education and Board Library Board have provided me with a draft report. I had several questions in relation to, in a number of areas, I wish to clarity in relation to that report, and the Board are now preparing a final report uh, for, for myself. Uh, the, I know that the, the board are engaging with yourself and the Gilmore family uh, about the events led, which led up to that tragedy, but not the, the, the criminal investigation being carried out by the PSNI, and are liaising with you and others in relation as to how they provide transport for the, for the Gilmore family going into the future. Um, this tragedy, for, foremost and without doubt, uh, has been 
for the Gilmore family to, to carry. Uh, and they, their loss is unbearable. And as a father myself of, of children around that age, I, I can only imagine the grief they're going through. But I do caution members about at this stage pointing the finger of blame or finger of accusation at any organisation. Because the organisations are made up of people. And those people not only have rights and entitlements, but they too have feelings. They too are conscious that decisions they now make could or may in the future be, end up in a tragedy such as we witnessed with the Gilmore family. Without any, without any intentions of them doing so, we, have, we, have, we expect our public servants to deliver a public service and they do so 99 times out of 100 above and beyond the call of duty. When something goes wrong, we have to ensure that all the facts are to the front and all facts are investigated before we start blaming anyone. And I think Members, two minutes is up. Okay. I call Ms. Bronwyn McGaugh. Uh, over the last year, the Anti-Bullying Forum has worked with 7,000 pupils in 37 schools and over 1,000 young people in 26 non-school settings to raise awareness and provide anti-bullying training. Ten seminars were, he were held aimed at enhancing anti-bullying policies and practices in schools, attracting 283 school leaders from across all the ELBs and all school types. This year, Anti-Bullying Week was a theme, Together We Will Make a Difference, ran from the 17th to the 21st of November. I attended the launch event on the 18th of November, where I presented prizes to the winners of the Arts and Creative Writing Competition, which received over 4,000 entries. More than double the number received last year. This shows the increasing awareness of this issue within schools. In late 2013, at my request, the forum undertook a review of anti-bullying practices and presented a report making a number of recommendations. This has led to an agreed joint working program for 14, 15 and beyond. One of the key recommendations was the strengthening of legislation to ensure greater consistency across all schools in tackling this problem. And on the 23rd of June, I announced my commitment to introduce anti-bullying legislation in the current Assembly mandate. Work on this is progressing, and it is my intention to begin a public consultation early in the new year, ahead of the introduction of the bill to the Assembly in May. Well, Ms. McGahan for supplementary. Uh, Gourmet Yoganan, I thank the Minister for his response. Minister, can I ask what guidance does the Department provide to schools on the issue of bullying? The Department has regularly updated its guidance to schools in relation to the incidents of bullying. All schools, by law, have to have an anti-bullying policy, and that policy should be developed in conjunction with staff, pupils and parents in consultation. Now, the, the exact detail of the anti-bullying policy is not set out in law, and that's the matter I want to return to in the consultation and the legislation I hope to bring before the Assembly in May, because I do think there has been a strong argument made to strengthen our anti-bullying legislation. But the way to eradicate bullying and to challenge bullying is by both adults and uh, children changing their attitudes and treating each other with respect for us to support the victims of bullying and also to, as strange as this may sound, support the perpetrators of bullying. Because when a young child is carrying out acts of bullying, you will often find that there are other problems at play in terms of the, family, of the child's own personal life, the family life, or other consequences bearing down on that child, and we have to investigate those to ensure that that child receives assistance as well. So, legislation is certainly one way forward, but to eradicate bullying in our, in our schools and in our workplace requires a change of attitudes by all involved. And Mrs. Karen McKevitt. Thanks very much, um, Mr. Deputy Chairman. Can I ask the Minister how his department determines um, the evidence um, of cyberbullying, particularly in the growing world uh, around social media? Well, again, this is an issue which is developing all the time, and we have offered further support to schools, but the situations can change so quickly uh, that it's difficult sometimes for guidance to keep up uh, with those who are involved in the internet or, or referred to here as cyberbullying. A number of departments are examining this matter. Uh, clearly, the recently reported CSE report, which has been taken under the guidance of the Health Minister, has some bearings in this as well. So, we are trying a number of elements to support schools, support individuals across the executive and within my department. Order, time is up. 
We will now move on to topical questions, and I call Mr. Sam Gardner. Mr. Gardner. Will the Minister tell us how many primary schools in both the state controlled and CCMS uh, sectors fall below the minimum en en enrolment levels for rural and urban schools? Um, I thank the member for his question, and I appreciate that, Mr. Speaker. These are topical questions. But uh, I, I can't have all that information with me on, on days like this. I'm more than happy to present and the member uh, with the information, but I will say this to him, and I'll emphasise this again, and I've said this many times in the House, this is not a numbers game. Uh, and while we can produce lists of schools that fall under 105 and 145 respectively, uh, I, I will not be held to the point of saying, well, the X amount of schools are in danger or X amount of schools are not in danger. The sustainable schools group uh, policy sets out the viability criteria of schools, and it's not simply a numbers game. Mr. Gardner, for supplement. I, I have noted the, the minister's comments that he will deal with it, and, and I accept that that he will write to me and put me in the picture. Thank you. Call Mr. Roy Beggs for topical quit. Uh, recently, a development proposal was made public in terms of expanding the, uh, the integrated post-primary school sector in my area. Can the Minister give further details of what all considerations he goes into when determining whether or not expansion should occur, particularly in advance of the area planning process? Well, without being specific about this particular development proposal, I'd give the member a broad outline of what areas we will go into. We will obviously make reference to the sustainable schools policy and to ensure ourselves that the development proposal is in line with that, with that sustainable schools policy. We will assess the impact in relation to other schools in the area, uh, and we will also obviously have to take into account in relation to any integrated or Irish medium proposal or statutory duty in relation to those both sectors. Mr. Beggs, for some comment. <clears throat> Uh, the expansion proposal, which was included in, in the discussions of the area planning process, could benefit all young people within the area and all schools. However, should expansion occur in advance of the process, the, it's the, the local grammar school and the integrated school who are, who are oversubscribed, and so the pupils will come from the controlled secondary sector. Would the Minister recognise that already uh, particularly Protestant boys are underachieving and it will be they who will be adversely affected. So will the Minister ensure that there will be an appropriate equality impact assessment so that we do not further disadvantage uh, members of our community in terms of any uh, change that may occur in advance of the area planning process? Well, I, again, I hope the Member appreciates I cannot discuss a specific development proposal as at the end of the day I am the decision maker in relation to that process. Uh, area planning in relation to post-primary has been published now for a number of years. It is an evolving process. Any decision I make in relation to the development proposal will have to have regard to uh, the area planning process and will have to prove to me that it has taken into account the area planning uh, proposals for that area. In terms of an equality impact assessment, I, I welcome the fact that the member now recognises uh, that selective schools in this area may be having a detrimental impact upon sections uh, of, in this case, uh, Protestant working class boys. Call Ms Paula Bradley for topical question. Speaker, can I ask the Minister um, what has been done to date in the preparation for the implementation authority in April 2015? Uh, what has been done to date, well, in fairness, the, the, the bill was only passed a number of weeks ago. I am now uh, in the process of writing out to the various bodies and political parties that have nominating rights to that authority. Uh, we have advertised for a chair. I am looking as to how we will then proceed in terms of the appointment of senior officers uh, to the body, taking into account uh, the stipulations placed within the legislation. Um, we are working in terms of the department in relation to a change management body. So there's a, there's a wide range of work going on in preparation for the implementation of the Education uh, Authority. Ms. Bradley, for supplement. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister. And I understand that it has been a short period, and I thank him for his answer. But can I also ask, does he, is he aware yet of any estimated saving um, this is going to have? Well, the estimated saving at this stage appears to equate to that what would have been 
uh, achievable under ESA, and that's uh, over a 10-year period, £180 million. Pounds. So we are going in the right direction in terms of it reducing our administration and our bureaucracy around education and targeting funds towards the front line, which is quite timely given the considerations we have to make around our budget uh, going into next year. Mr. Mickey Brady for topic. I got uh, last concordia. Could I ask the Minister for his response to the recent comments that our education system is segregated? Well, I, I personally do not like this term, segregated, because it implies that those who choose, whatever sector parents choose or, or pupils choose, that they are segregationists, and that implies the southern states of America. And I find it offensive when supporters of one sector then lambast you uh, across social media with, with photographs of uh, divisions in southern state schools during the 50s and 60s and accuse you because you've taken the right decision. I have to say, accuse me when I've taken the right decision in relation to not uh, agreeing to a development proposal in relation to an integrated school that you're somehow a segregationist. Segregation is based on being forced into one sector or another. Parents here have choices, and I continue that choice, uh, support of choice. Mr. Brady, for supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer. Could the Minister outline how our system enables young people to come together in their learning process? Or am I good? Well, yes, and this is one of the areas where politicians have caught up uh, with education and caught up with many parents and schools. Shared education may be a new concept to many politicians, but it's certainly not a new concept to many of our schools who have been involved in shared education over many, many years, have built up working relationships and personal relationships across sectors. We now have caught up with them. Uh, we now are in a position to invest quite significantly in shared education going into the future, where young people will be learning about each other from each other. Because difference is not the problem in our society. It's how we treat difference is the problem. And if we learn to respect difference, then we'll go a long way to resolving uh, many of the issues in our divided society. Bronwyn McGappin for topical question. Uh, can I ask the Minister for, for an update on the Capital Bill project for the shared educational campus uh, for St John's Primary School Moy and Moy Regional School? Uh, the Moy project is one of three schemes I announced in July to, support, uh, to be supported under the Shared Education Campuses Programme. It's in the very early stages of development. A project board has been established and a site search for a new campus is currently underway. The Southern Education Library Board will carry out the technical feasibility study and economic appraisal for the project in conjunction with CCMS. Ms. McGahan for a supplement. Gurumi Yogatan, I thank the Minister for his response. Uh, can I ask the Minister to, to detail the wider benefits of the Capital Bill project to the local construction industry and the community in terms of social clauses? Well, uh, since 2009, the Department of Education have had social clauses attached to their Capital Bills programme uh, for schools, and it is about hiring the long term unemployed, ensuring that apprenticeships are taking on, ensuring that young people are given an opportunity to gain their first meaningful employment moving forward. And these obviously have wider ripple effect within our society when you give particularly young people uh, meaningful employment. As I have stated before in terms of my main objective has to be to provide new schools. However, uh, the spending of public funds in this manner also ensures that there is investment in the construction industry and it is worked out around uh, of every £1 invested by my department in a new school in terms of construction, £2.84 of that uh, goes into the economy. It creates £2.84 in the broader economy. So it's quite a significant economic driver. And uh, as we move forward and through the discussions around the draft budget, I am particularly and will be highlighting, I have said this before, I will be engaging with the finance minister around the proposed draft capital budget for education because I am concerned it will not be suffice to bring forward the developments we have in the pipeline. Mr Raymond McCartney is not in his place. I call Mr Kieran McCarthy. Mr Deputy Speaker, can the Minister confirm or at least give us an estimate of the numbers of primary school pupils that are currently sitting the AQE and GL selection tests? Um, I, I cannot confirm it because they have absolutely nothing to do with my department. I read speculation in the newspapers and the media 
about the number of sitting. As far as I'm concerned, one sitting and there's far too many. Mr McCarthy, for supplement. Mr. Deputy Speaker, given that some uh, pupils um, or some schools have and are openly preparing children for the selection tests, and equally other schools are refusing to do so, um, is there anything that the minister can or intends to do to regu regularise what is happening and uh, simply provide a level playing field for all of our school children? Well, uh, I have proposed a level playing facility for all our school children, and they should be able to transfer into their nearest. Uh, good school. Primary schools should not be preparing any child or disrupting the curriculum in any way for the advantages of an outside body. And that's what's happening. Because it's not for the advantages of the child, it's for the advantages of an outside body. And one of the, the numbers that they will not report to you in the weeks and months ahead is how many of these children that these bodies have decided are failures. You won't publish those figures, you won't see them emblazoned across front pages of newspapers or uh, on social media about how many people AQE have rejected or how many people GML have rejected. But then children will be rejected in a few months' time. So I would advise parents not to be uh, bought into this marketing ploy. And I would say firmly to primary schools, any primary school that is preparing a child for unregulated tests in curriculum time and using school resources will be challenged by my department. Mr Alex Atwood for a topical question. Could I ask the Minister to confirm, um, in the light of the review that has been conducted by the uh, uh, Minister for Employment and Learning in relation to future teacher training provision, to detail specifically what conversations you have been having with him in relation to uh, the future teacher training and the future of St Mary's University College in particular? I, I can detail those conversations very easily. I haven't had any because it's not my responsibility. It would be like uh, the Dale Minister coming to me and asking me about development proposal A, B, and C. It's none of his business. In relation to the, develop, or the proposals or the report, I clearly have a copy of the report, I have read the report, but the decisions around that report are solely a matter for the Dale Minister. I am surprised by that reply. And I am surprised by that reply because you cannot divorce the world from education from the world of further education. You cannot divorce the issue of teacher training provision in our secondary and primary schools from teacher training, teacher training in our third level institutions. It is one of the most self evident examples, in my view, Minister, where this requires joined up Sorry, thinking. And, and the reason I would put to you, Minister, would you not agree? That given that Mr. Farry has, I would suggest, a very clear, if not dogmatic, agenda when it comes to teacher training, is this not a place where you, as a minister, with, it, with your responsibility, should show better authority? I'm not sure which part of that speech to respond to. Um, I'll, I'll try and pull a question out of it somewhere. Uh, Mr. Atwood is acutely aware, and I, I, I know exactly what he's asking and why he's asking, and I said to him before. He's actually preparing a press release to run out to the West Belfast papers and point fingers and make all sorts of accusations. But the reality of the situation is this. My role in terms of teacher training is to indicate to the Dell Minister how many teachers I believe to be required to be trained in the coming years. It is then the responsibility of the Dell Minister to provide the training places if he agrees with me on those matters. He will also then, it's up to the Dell Minister to decide where those training institutions will be. Now, I may have views as to where those training institutions uh, should be and where uh, high-quality training, uh, teacher training is being provided. And we're fortunate that we have a, a number of colleges, a significant number of colleges, providing uh, high-quality teacher training. But that is not my role. It's the role for the Dale Minister. Well, Mr. Fran McCann. Coral Mila Malgat, Alas Count Corla. The BELP has recently led a cons consultation process into the future of Malb Malvern Street School. Does the Minister know if this is completed and what the next steps are regarding the future of the school? Uh, I am aware uh, of the consultation in relation to a DP for Malvern Street. I understand that the pre-consultation process is now being completed and that a report will be brought to the Belfast Education and Library Board 
in the next number of weeks, and then the Belfast Education Library Board will decide what, if any, steps they're going to take next. Our time is up.